like to welcome all of you to today's uh, um, program, which is organized as part of the Cambridge Science Festival. And this is organized at the Cambridge Community TV. Uh, it's a pleasure to see all of you here. Uh, today, our talk is going to be about science and what scientists do. And particularly, we want to introduce you to women in science. And if you sort of look at what is science, science is about discovery. Science is about knowledge. Science is about organizing data. Science is, it means a lot of things to a lot of people. And basically, what we are looking at is what, what do scientists want or what do scientists do? Scientists are motivated by curiosity. They feel passionate about something. And they also want to serve humanity. And that's what science is all about in our perspective. And you're going to meet four exciting women. One of them is me. And we are going to talk about our lines of research and our work, and what is it that makes us what we are, and what we do for our living, and what we feel passionate about. I also want to talk a little bit more about science in the sense that science has a particular method in which our scientists have a particular method in which they go about collecting data. They follow what is called a scientific method. So they have to gather information. They have to have hypothesis. They have to test models. And instinctively, you are trying to find solutions. And some of these solutions, of course, have great benefits for mankind. And all of the examples that we are going to show you today is all about how does it benefit society. Because you and I ultimately are the society. And we would like to know what science can do for us. So scientists sort of discover new things. They discover new drugs. They cure illness. Uh, they look at the Earth. They look at global warming. Uh, they look at the impact on disappearance or appearance of fish. They look at exciting new worlds, like the discovery of a new Earth-like uh, planet someplace. So all of this together, in a nutshell, describes to you the excitement that's involved in science and why we as scientists feel so happy to be scientists you know, in many ways. So I want to talk about each one of us in terms of a little preview of what is to come in our talks. I would like to introduce you to um, Irena Bosch, who's sitting next to me. And her commitment is to finding a cure for a disease. And she's looking at a dengue fever. And as many of you know, there's a resurgence of this disease. And much of this resurgence is caused because of um, you know, the way humans sort of habitate the world in today's world. I mean, we live in marginal areas. Uh, there's global warming, as many of you know. Mosquitoes sort of breed in different areas than they did before. And so what is the connection? The connection is the impact of man or, you know, our activity, human activity on the Earth's surface. And she's interested more at looking at uh, illness and disease vectors in particular. And if you take a different perspective on science and slightly change the focus and look at the Earth, I'm interested in oceans and marine organisms. And in particular, I'm interested in coral reefs. And when you begin to look at coral reefs, you see the disappearance uh, of many of the corals. Corals are being bleached. Corals are dying. What is it that is causing these massive disturbances in the ocean? Not all of us have the pleasure of going underwater and looking at these corals. But let me tell you that there's a lot that's going on underneath the ocean surface. And in this particular venture, I'm joined by many, many different sciences. So I want to sort of emphasize that science is about collaboration. It's ecologists are interested, climatologists are interested, and spatial scientists like myself are interested in modeling the impact. And in the end, it is the human societies that have to be involved in this kind of venture. Because we as scientists can say, this is a model, this is our prediction. But people have to participate in this model and decision making and carry the science back into their society to create what's called sustainable environment. So we really need people's participation. And that's my emphasis. Megali Koch, who's sitting on the other side, is interested in water. And as many of you know, the Earth's population at this point in time is about 6.4 you know, billion. As people sort of, as the population explodes, and as people begin to look for ways of getting to water, which is the most basic thing that we need for our existence, there is not much surface water left, especially in arid and semi-arid environments. And Megali's research is to use technology and a lot of different sensors to get to this question of water. 
And the last scientist who's on the panel is looking upwards at skies, and she's motivated by curiosity. And she's um, interested in finding uh, gravitational, how gravitational energy release from matter uh, falling onto a neutron star or black hole is the most efficient way that we know to extract energy from matter. And it's common throughout the universe. And she's going to explain her research and her paradigm um, to you. So we hope to bring and transmit and transform the knowledge of what we have to you and share with us, or share with you our passion for science. And in the end, it's the service of humanity that's the most motivating factor for most of us. Thank you. So my name is Irene Bosch. I am a specialist in infectious tropical diseases. I worked at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. And the topic that I'll be uh, referring you to, to today is actually a infectious disease caused by a virus. And uh, this virus is actually transmitted by the bite of a mosquito, which you see here. And through that bite, uh, we can get very ill. And exactly that is uh, what I study. It's uh, trying to find why is it that people can get so um, ill? And why is it that even though we all get this disease, not all of us actually die from it, even though there are great numbers of, of people who die around the world, a tropical world, uh, with this disease. And this is because of the immune system that can actually defend us from this uh, disease that allows us to survive. And the truth is that uh, because th this is complicated, because there's no therapy and no vaccines that can actually help us fight this disease, that we are in the hands of our immune system like we were, you know, 100 or 200 year years ago with other illnesses that now have proper ways to defend ourselves with vaccines. The mosquito that transmit the virus, it lives in a tropical part of the world, indicated here as a uh, color uh, world distribution. And the graph shows that indeed the numbers of people that get this illness increases over, over time. So this is a re-emergent disease in terms of the problems that brings to, to our world. And the way in which it happens is an epidemic it, uh, form of it because the numbers of people that can get the disease over time can increase very rapidly. And again, it has to do with the amount of mosquito bites that a, a group of people can be exposed to and uh, suffer from, from that at a given time. And this uh, exemplifies uh, what happened in Venezuela in a short period of weeks. So it's very complex disease because it goes from very uh, mild to a very severe and exactly that's why the work that I do is important because very little is known on, on, on how this happens. So we're really working so hard because one day we want to find a way to either understand it and find proper therapies to, to combat, combat the, this problem. One of them being the bleeding, of course, is a, also a bleeding uh, disease. And here you see the uh, cartoon of the inside of the vessel. And basically, uh, the molecular understanding of that is one of the main focus of our work. I want to just mention a lot of people who work in this. This is the work of many, and indeed, the to really comprehend this problem, you need the help of those who understand the environment and the change of, of the environment, those who understand the change in, or the behavior of the mosquitoes that trans transmit the disease, and those who actually understand and work in the, in the disease part and in the human and cellular aspect. So as you can see, there is a tremendous amount of knowledge that you can have to put together in order to have an ultimate solution for this problem. 
So one day when you have a person going to a tropical part of the world, you might um, find out that that person got a disease or a fever. So that could actually be dengue. So now you can, even though live in a part of the world that might not be every day exposed to this, it actually um, happens to many people around the world in great proportions. And near 2 billion people are exposed to these mosquitoes and diseases. And what I want to finish up uh, doing is to show you a couple of the very uh, beautiful places that we also get to see when we travel in the tropical world. And these are pictures of Venezuela and Brazil. And uh, we hope that by collecting the knowledge of different areas of, of um, research, we will ultimately have in our hands a possible comprehension and ultimate cure. But we don't have it now. So. With these pictures, I finish my short introduction, and we go to our next speaker. So now we can go. So the title of my talk, which is to do with uh, marine biology, as I already told you, is the eternal triangle, which means that there are a lot of different sciences uh, that are involved in solving this problem. Basically, I'm trying to understand, along with a bunch of other scientists, we are trying to understand the connection between the ecology of the ocean, the coastal environment, which is the people who live in the coastal environments, and the public policy part of it, which is an, sort of a mysterious part that no scientist wants to really account for, but it has to be accounted for because we need to make practical decisions. And that's why the title. I also told you before that I, as a single solo person, cannot do all this research. So there are a lot of other collaborators, and I wish to acknowledge the help of Professor Les Kaufman, who is actually a marine biologist from Boston University, as well as a number of my students, both graduate and undergraduate students on this project. So if, to give you a little bit of a background of the marine world, the ocean covers about 71% of the Earth's surface. And as you can see, it's one of the richest resources that we have. Right now, increasingly, a large number of people on the Earth's surface are depending on the ocean for fishing. And Many people in these coastal areas, especially the coral reefs that I'm talking about, depend on the ocean because of tourism. They become tourist guides and they take a lot of uh, tourist visitors into these reefs to explore and to have fun. So the diversity of the ocean exceeds that of the land in terms of all that we know of categories of species. And we also know that many of the species may be dying and there are new species yet to be discovered in many of the oceans. So the ocean is the next big frontier in terms of the science. I have wanted to tell you a little bit more about the demographics. Two thirds of the world's people live near the oceans. That means these are the people that live in these marine areas, marine ecosystems, and they depend on fishing, tourism, recreation, as I already told you. And there's a lot of economic value to fishing. Very poor people make a livelihood out of fishing. And of course, there's also commercial fishing that many of you probably know about because increasingly there's an emphasis on commercial fishing. So there's a need for marine conservation because of the fact that there are a lot of threats that are happening because of things like global warming, um, rapid change in the ecosystems along the coast, and so on. We really need to sort of be aware of the fact that conservation should be a priority for many of these regions. And we, I am sort of in a field which is to do with modeling, and I make predictive models. I tell you if a certain input changes, this is the kind of impact that I would find on an output. So you could sort of say, you know, what are the factors that govern a fish catch on a particular day along the coast of Belize? My model should be able to predict in some sense what is the expected output. And so I have inputs and outputs to the system, 
And as I'm acknowledging here, this is a project that's funded right now by Conservation International. And it's a huge model. And I'm only sort of giving you a glimpse of the model uh, in terms of just to tell you the complexity. Here is a map. Unfortunately, you can't see, but you can access this particular lecture on the website. And this is what is called a socioeconomic model and combination of the ecological model. And it tells you that there are more than 300 to 500 different concepts you know, that you could look if you were to make a mind map of the whole entire spectrum of the problem that I'm looking at. So it's pretty complicated. All of these here represent the concepts. So if you tell me what is coral bleaching, I should be able to track up and tell you coral bleaching is connected with this. And this factor is connected with the next factor and so on. And basically be able to tell you maybe there's some relationship between coral bleaching and climate change and ocean currents. And there are a lot of unknowns, there are a lot of knowns. And this mapping kind of tells me where exactly should I focus on? What is the unknown? What is the known? And how do I proceed with my science? And what kind of scientist do I need? Do I need an economist? Do I need a social scientist? Do I need an ecologist? I should be able to do that with this mind mapping. Unfortunately, you don't see the interactivity. The whole map moves, and it's like your brain in action. Let me tell you that. Um, moving on, um, this particular aspect looks at just maps. Many of us are very excited with Google Earth Maps. And this is the mapping, which kind of takes you to the actual spot on the Earth's surface, uses a wide variety of spatial technology, and shows you maps that you are making to understand different aspects. Here is a map which shows you the impact of agriculture in Belize. So if you look along the coast of Belize, we want to sort of find out how much is the fertilizer that people are putting in into the agricultural fields, and how much of the fertilizer is being run off and it's coming into the ocean and being dumped in the ocean. And the ocean currents carry these phosphorus and all of the you know, kind of fertilizer into the coral reefs, and it's going to impact the reefs. So we are trying to work the whole system and trying to understand what is the impact you know, of one ton of fertilizer that's put in an agricultural plot in Belize. And this shows you that. And we've actually built a pretty good model of the watershed and the water runoff by the various rivers. Most of the pollution is from the land you know, that's going into the ocean. And I'm sure most of you know this. Here is a map which shows the risk and the sediment damage that's coming into the coastal reefs of Belize. So the sediment loading clouds up all the water, and the different risk surfaces here are shown in blue. And you can give a spatial impact of the risk, which part of the ocean or which part of the coral reef is the most impacted by what kind of change that's taking place on the land. So you begin to understand risk. And the minute you put a risk and show it back to the fishermen or the coastal manager of these marine projects along the coast of Belize or along the coast of Fiji and so on, they begin to see things differently because they then know what to do in terms of a policy. And remember, I was emphasizing policy all the time, saying science is fine, but we need to sort of have a policy in place. And somebody has to implement the policy in order to have, in order to have the science impact the actual uh, living conditions. So the, this part actually zooms in. And this is another ma map which shows you, again, the area of impact of the coast of Belize City. And you, again, begin to appreciate the power of the maps. Maps are like a medium of communication. So the minute I show you the map, everything changes. I could have told you this in 10 sentences, but you know, picture is worth a thousand words, and that's what I want to show you here. And we are also building these so-called decision tools for the manager in the ground. Ultimately, this project that's funded by Conservation International is interested in giving a tool to the managers. So our model is sort of programmed in what's called Java. So any manager can come in and input a bunch of factors. And this part of the screen will light up and show the manager the so-called you know, independent variables. What's the amount of fish that I catch? You know, what is the amount of risk that I'm carrying into the ocean surface? So I'm sort of modeling the factors on one side, independent factors on one side, and the dependent factors on that screen. And everything depends on the manager. He comes in and inputs what he perceives to be the problem plaguing his own area of management. And on this screen, the manager begins to see the map. 
you know, the map of agriculture, the soils, the geology, everything that governs that particular ecosystem and the impact on the ocean. So these are all the so-called interactive maps that all of us, I think, use, you know, the driving instructions that you see on the Google Maps. It's the same idea or principle in terms of mapping. And, you know, in conclusion, I would like to say science is about collaboration. And no science that I showed you here is solely my science. It's everybody's science. There are like literally hundreds of scientists working in this particular area of marine conservation, which has been recognized to be one of the most critical things in terms of preservation. And a lot of coastal communities depend on fishing and depend on these coral reefs. And we really need to make sure that it is conserved, not for our generation, but for the future of these young people sitting over here. Thank you so much. Very good. Thanks. I'm going to give an overview of Earth observation satellites and how geologists or geoscientists use these tools to discover, map, monitor, and manage natural resources around the world. This technology is particularly useful in arid environments where the exploration and assessment of water resources is much needed but often difficult. Um, to conduct because of either limited uh, uh, ground information, detailed ground information, for example, uh, maps, geological maps or hydrological maps, um, but also because desert areas are often very remote and often inaccessible. So what exactly is Earth observation from space? Here we are looking at northern Africa. This is a beautiful uh, image from the NOAA AVHRR uh, sensor. This is uh, an American satellite. And we see in th on this image, we see two very distinctive regions. On one hand, we see the uh, Sahara Desert to the north, and then we see to the south, south of it, in red colors, we see the tropical uh, rainforest. Now, the, there are two unusual things about uh, this image or this photograph. First, for example, the rainforest is shown in red and the desert is shown in um, sort of bluish, purplish colors. This is because this picture was taken with a remote sensing device that can see in wavelength regions beyond the visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is also the sunlight. And this image, this particular image is actually uh, showing you the infrared region. Now, the human eye cannot see in infrared. We don't know uh, what color infrared is. That is why we call this type of picture false color images. Basically, colors are assigned arbitrarily to those wavelength regions that we cannot see because they are beyond the visible light portion of the spectrum. Another unusual aspect of this picture is that there are no or very little clouds, except that in Nigeria you have some clouds, which is very unusual for tropical environments. The reason for this is that in reality we are not looking at one single image or snapshot. We are looking at a mosaic of many images. And this particular uh, satellite takes an image of um, every, uh, any spot on the surface every day. So basically, multiple scenes or images were selected in such a way that they are cloud-free and put together in a mosaic to give us this beautiful view of Africa. How, however, how do geologists use these images for mapping land surface and its resources? This image shows you another mosaic uh, with the Landsat uh, TM sensor of Egypt. Again, we are looking at um, an Im uh, image processed mosaic that uh, enhances very subtle uh, tonal differences within the uh, desert area. So we get a quite, uh, you know, um, colorful image of the desert. And I would like to point out 
two, two features actually. Um, you see on the, um, the left side these linear features which are basically sand dunes, moving sand dunes that move along the prevailing uh, wind direction. We also see the Nile the river and the delta in red again because this image uh, shows the uh, infrared region of the spectrum and vegetation reflects a lot of light in the infrared whereas the surrounding sand reflects less light in that spectral region. I also would like to show, show you an interesting triangular feature. This is the ancient Nile or the ancient Nile Delta I should say. It is nowadays covered by sand but because this image was processed in such a way that the delta deposits of the ancient Nile um, reflect the light very different from the surrounding sand and this is why we can see uh, the, basically the, the, the shape of the ancient Nile. Let's now take a look at the bedrock area, the hard rock area along the Red Sea coast. Here we have a shuttle space shuttle picture showing the Red Sea hills in uh, Sudan and we see basically in dark colors the hard rock, bad rock and in light colors we see the sand. Geologists use this type of pictures to map drainage and fracture networks. Satellite images are ideal for mapping water courses and arid lands. These are basically uh, linear features in the bad rock and they show, show up very, uh, um, they stand up because of their brighter Colored. These are the wadi deposits, or um, wadis, I should say, are dry river systems that, um, that reflect light different from the bedrock. These water courses are, are formed or were formed during wetter climatic periods in the past. Nowadays, they carry surface water only occasionally when it rains in the mountains. The patterns of these drainage uh, systems are caused by the physical characteristics of the rock. Let's take a closer look at uh, these wadi systems and uh, unfortunately this graph here which should basically give you sort of a, a cross section uh, from the uh, Nubian desert, the inner you know, basin area, then uh, crossing the Red Sea hills, the mountain area and then into the Red Sea. This cross section, uh, unfortunately you can't see it hardly, should show you how rainfall would you know, infiltrate or would percolate through the hard rock and eventually find its way down to the sea or down to the uh, Nubian desert through these fractures, which are basically cracks or weakness zone in, uh, in the hard rock. This is a photograph taken from an airplane that shows you these wadi systems. Again, you can see that these are dry rivers. Um, they are filled with deposit, sand deposits, and stand out from the darker uh, mountain area. I would like you to pay attention to the fact that uh, these uh, wadis or dry rivers are quite straight, their courses are quite straight. This is an indication for geologists that they actually are controlled by fracture systems and these fractures, cracks in the rock are very important for groundwater to accumulate and um, and to be transmitted basically uh, uh, downhill. And this is a view of these wadi systems from the ground. You see in the back, the far back, here are the mountain ranges from the Red Sea mountain ranges and these are the wadis and what you see basically are the alluvial fans and I'm, I'm, I took this image, um, you know, facing the, the inland mountains and uh, I had the sea on my back. Now I want to say just a few words about these wadis and wadi networks um, and their importance in, uh, in um, providing water. Wadi networks collect water from va vast surface area in the mountain and when the rainwater from the mountain tops is confined in these channels, flash floods may occur. Now flash floods can be very destructive and uh, not many people 
uh, know that actually fewer people die in the deserts, uh, you know, from thirst, and they actually die, or uh, when that happened, they die from flash flood, flash flood uh, waters. And finally, let me show you a three-dimensional view of a satellite image that shows two of these wadis. Um, this is a false color picture taken with an Aster image from the Terra satellite. And it has been manipulated in such a way that distinctive rock units appear in, uh, you know, in, very, in a very colorful manner. Uh, geologists can use this type of images to actually create a geological map and to also map these um, uh, water courses. Now, not only geologists, but also archaeologists are interested in studying the landscape in, uh, in arid environments, because in this case, an ancient port was located right at the mouth of one of these wadis. This flag here indicates the location of an archaeological site. Now, this is a Landsat TM image that was enhanced again with a computer in such a way that the individual rock types show up very clearly. And not only that, but you can also see features along the, uh, the, the coast, for example, the coral reefs. And these darker features turned out to be playa lakes, ancient lakes. Uh, it is uh, believed that uh, the ancient people were able to survive in this harsh environment because flash floods would you know, um, occasionally fill these lakes, and that was their source of fresh water. So geologists can use this type of images to understand how surface and subsurface water move from the recharge so zone in the mountains down to the discharge zone in coastal areas. Water is a very precious resource in arid lands and need to be used and managed in a sustainable way. And with this, I finish my presentation. So, I'm trying to talk about outer space, and it it's in it's in uh, applications, I think, but. <clears throat> And ap the outer space is actually quite vast, but the objects I study are rather small compared to the uh, volume of, of the whole of outer space. And the objects I'll be talking to you about are X-ray binaries and planetary nebulae. These are two very different beasts, but it turns out they both share something in common, what astronomers call the endpoints of stellar evolution. These are compact objects, which are white dwarfs, neutron stars, and black holes. And these are actually formed when normal stars die. And if you leave them alone, they're going to be static over the lifetime of the universe, which is why they're known as the endpoints of stellar evolution. But if you match them up with a companion star, then uh, they can come to life in some rather spectacular ways. Um, <laughs> I, I, OK, I'll keep talking. So X-ray binary stars are systems where you have uh, two stars. One of them is a compact object. One of them is a normal star going around each other. And for these particular systems, you have matter from the normal star funneling over onto the compact object. Now, when that compact object is a white dwarf, it's not normally called an X-ray binary. This is because those systems emit most of their light in the optical. And this light variations are rather startling. So they've been observed for many hundreds of years, and they're known as cataclysmic variables. But systems where the compact object is a neutron star or a black hole um, were not discovered until the 70s when the first X-ray satellites went up. And these are the first sources that were identified with non-solar X-rays. And this is why they're known as X-ray binaries. That's where they emit most of their energies. <clears throat> now, as matter falls from a normal star onto a compact object, because the two objects are rotating about each other, the matter can't fall directly onto the other object. That object itself is rotating. So what it does, it spirals in, forming what we call an accretion disk. <clears throat> and in certain systems, neutron star systems, if you have very high magnetic fields, sometimes what you can get 
is um, that the emission that comes out is aligned along the magnetic axis. Now presume that this is the magnetic axis. If the magnetic axis is not aligned with the rotation axis, which is going to be this, for example, if it's like this, as the neutron star rolls around, you can see this thing flashing on and off, and that's why they're called pulsars. Now, the accretion disk systems that I study, unfortunately, I have a little model here with me. This is an accretion disk. And you would consider this is a disk. The matter has been spiraling in and will go on to this compact object. Well, as the matter is dropping onto this object, it's getting hotter and hotter. So the material on the surface of the normal star is best seen in optical light. It's like our sun. And then by the time it gets to the edge of the accretion disk, it's more prominent in ultraviolets. And as it goes in, it gets hotter and hotter until at the inner edge of the disk, it's actually emitting in x-rays. And that's where most of this stuff is coming out from. So if you're trying to look at this system, the systems, if I ever get an image I can show you, are much smaller than uh, even the size of the um, orbit of the Earth around the sun. And because they had great distances, we really can't see the images. We can't resolve them with our eyes. So the only way to any find out any information is to look at the light that comes from them and see how it varies with time and in, in the kind of elements that you see in, in the spectra. So if you take a system like a, a accretion disk and you consider that we have several time variabilities, we have the, the rotation of the neutron star, which is going round and round. We also have the orbit of the two stars along each other. And then we find a third variability in some systems that are much longer than either of these periods. And we decided that this must come from the uh, movement of the accretion disk. So if the, if the system, for example, was looking at you just like this, no matter how it rotated, you'd always see the same amount of light. If it was like this, again, you'd see different light, but you'd see the same amount of light. But supposing this disk was precessing, then if you look at that blue, you'll see that you see different amounts of it. In fact, in fact you see different amounts of the different temperatures on each of these surface. And we can take all of those amounts and actually uh, model them. And we can model the, ah, good, good. Let's go on, I didn't even know it was up there, okay. So you saw this, this is what I wanted to show you. Um, there is, this is actually our sun compared to a massive system with a neutron star. And this is again our sun. So you can see that these systems can be vastly different in size, but they're still too small to be um, uh, uh, resolved by, by the eye. We don't actually make images of them. These are all, of course, artist conception. And here I was trying to show you, these are actually four different satellites looking at the same object, and these are two ground-based observatories. And what we have plotted here is the amount of light by versus time. And if you look at the different satellites, which are all looking basically at different temperatures, you see that the change is very different from, one, um, uh, from each temperature to the other. The actual variations over time change. And that's the variations that you see when you go like this, because the different temperatures, you see different amounts of them. Um, and then another way that we can image it is by using Doppler tomography, which is a method very similar to the medical tomography. And what you do then is you use these line emissions. I'm, I plotted here uh, nitrogen-5 lines that were observed with the Hubble Space Telescope. And you can see that as you go around the binary orbit, these line formations change very much. So if you invert them using this tomographic method, and here I have some tomo tomograms plotted, which the big circles here are the normal companion star, and the little circle is representing uh, the neutron star in this particular case. And you can see that the lower temperature emission is coming mostly from the surface of the normal star, whereas the higher temperature emission is coming from near the neutron star. And this is, this is the kind of modeling that lets us know about X-ray binaries. Do I actually have time for planetary nebulae? OK. So uh, planetary nebulae are objects that form when a sun-like star dies. And what happens in various times of a star's life is that, for example, when it stops burning hydrogen in its, in its center and converting it into helium, uh, the helium starts burning really drastically and converting into higher elements. And at this stage in the star's life, it starts to expand very much. And it can reach a stage where it has expanded so much that the, it, the gravitational pressure cannot 
keep the star together and the outer layers uh, get emitted. And so what we see when you're looking at planetary nebula is those outer layers and as they interact with the interstellar medium. So here are some examples of looking at both um, optical with HST and Chandra with X-ray observations of uh, planetary nebulae. And this is the very first detection of a planetary nebulae in X-rays. And as you can see, unlike the X-ray binaries, we can actually image these systems because they're very close to us. And this is a Hubble um, optical of a picture of the same one. And this is a Gemini uh, ground-based telescope, which is looking in infrared, actually, similar to um, Magali. And as you can see, the X-rays are off to one side. They're all contained within this outer ring, but they're off to one side. Another system here, this is again the optical image from Hubble and the uh, X-ray image from Chandra. And you can see that there is some kind of a, um, uh, a, a direction, sort of a jet-like emission coming off to one end of the X-rays. And finally, this one where the optical Hubble picture is shown in the blue and the X-rays, the, the hot temperatures in red. And again, you can see a sort of jet-like uh, emission. These light-like systems appear common in all of these objects that we're looking at, and it's something that we do not as yet understand. Now I have uh, uh, just, this is actually work done by a colleague of mine on one of these planetary nebulae, which is called a red rectangle, because from the ground, that's what it looks like. But this Hubble uh, picture shows you that it's in fact um, extremely complex with these sort of ladder-like structure coming out here. And if, um, uh, what Vincent Inke, di Inke did is to model the system. And he took the known temperatures and densities as measured from observations. He assumed that, in fact, this turns out to be a double star system that is ejecting matter like every hundred, few hundred years. And so each of these, or each of these extension is from a different explosion of this double system. And um, I guess that's all I want to really say for myself. And I get to go on and tell you a little bit about what open questions remain for all of us. Uh, this is not the open questions. So quickly. Quickly, very, OK. The open questions. Well, <laughs> Suchi's, I will tell you right away, this is not the open questions either. <laughs> Where are they? Oh, here they are. OK, sorry. So Suchi's. <laughs> is um, the, 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 impact, how, the impact of global warming on corals and benthic populations, which is very important nowadays because of the conservation is so critical to, to, to the world's future. And as she has pointed out, the most important thing is that you need cross-disciplinary collaborations in order to address this kind of global societal problem. As Megali pointed out, to help the arid lands of this world, new untapped water, groundwater resources need to be identified and explored. Additional water resources can be found in fractured aquifer systems where groundwater accumulation occurs along open and well-connected fractures. However, determining these flow paths in bedrocks is a very difficult task. We still know, know too little about how geological structures control groundwater movement. And we need a full understanding of bedrock hydrology, uh, that is, how the sets of fractures are connected into flow paths over the various scales. And finally, how remote sensing can be used to extrapolate this local information into the synthesis, synthesis of a regional groundwater. From Irene, we understood that open questions for dengue research involve finding the mechanisms by which diseases work to find out why some people react by getting really sick and even dying, whereas others may not respond at all. Once scientists find out the mechanisms by which viruses attack cells and modify the immune, 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 <laughs> immune response, they will be better able to find new therapies. That is, to contribute to cures with new medicines, scientists need to find out the molecular basis of disease. Now, astrophysics, as I mentioned, is concerned with the physical understanding of the structure and evolution through time of the universe from all sorts of scales, from that of uh, stars with planetary systems around them out to the biggest scales in the universe, which is clusters and superclusters of galaxies. So major uh, questions include how the matter and the energy that is ejected through the stellar wind and through supernova explosions from stars actually affect the galaxy that they are in. 
Since their formation in the early universe, galaxies have been changing because of their interactions with neighboring bodies and also because of the stellar evolution of the objects within them. And we do not have a very good understanding of how the very different types of galaxies we see are actually constructed. And of course, on the larger scale, although we have some reason for confidence in the overall picture, the Big Bang, uh, most of the matter that is detected by its gravitational interaction is dark matter, which is some unknown kind of form um, um, material that we do not know what it actually is. And in fact, the majority of the density of the universe is even more mysterious than that, the so-called dark energy, which I'm sure you've heard about. And until we fully understand both the small and the large scales of the universe, we'll never be able to really either predict the future or find out what happened in the past within our universe. So are there any questions? There's a microphone in the center if anybody dares to come up and speak. We have lots of questions, so we hope you have some too. And your questions may help us address some of our issues. Have, have there been any cases of dengue fever reported in the United States? Just go to the microphone. Could you go, okay, could, could you go to the microphone at the center? Mm -hmm. And Irene, you're going to have to handle that. So the question is, have there been any cases? Repeat her question. Well, she's going to come. Have, have there been any cases of dengue fever? reported in the United States? Yes, uh, dengue fever has been uh, centuries back, 1800s, 1900s, uh, present in the North American continent and in actual times as well. And we're talking about, of course, the warm parts where the Aedes aegypti reproduces. This is Texas, as well as outbreaks in Hawaii. So the answer is yes, United States uh, does have outbreaks. The magnitude of those outbreaks in the United States are very small in comparison to those in Asia and South America, Central America, and the Caribbean due to the um, very strict controls of mosquitoes in the warm areas of the United States. Uh, what is the, the main reason that uh, it's difficult just to get a, a, like a vaccine against this virus? What, what is the, the trick that this virus presents that uh, you know, makes it so difficult? First, so difficult. Uh, as you may know, there have been a very successful uh, stories about vaccination, polio, and uh, smallpox, of course. So why not to extrapolate that to, let's say, another disease? Uh, even yellow fever, which is a sister uh, virus to dengue. And the, the, the lack of enough effort put into from the scientific community will be one of them. The other one is that uh, the money and the resources that you need to then come with a solution that is as important as that is not there. So we, we need to emphasize that more help from the scientific uh, world has to come to make this a possibility. And the third one, which is more uh, you know, biologically, uh, if you wish, is because dengue in itself is an immunological disease. And it's very complicated because it turns out that you're actually more in danger if you have a second bite with a second virus. There are four viruses. So you have to make sure you do a pentavalent vaccination. So, and uh, we can get other questions. Thank you. So, so maybe we should turn around and ask you questions. <laughs> right. um, so what do you think should scientists do in terms of increasing public awareness and participation of young people in science? What do you think we should be doing as a community? What, is, what, should, what should be our responsibility to motivate more people to be scientists? You can well, come up to the mic. I want to be a scientist. I, and I think that my upbringing and my whole world has been different. But I'm very happy to see, like when I look at you guys, um, that 
Can you come up to the come microphone? To the microphone so it's like the cat. So when I look at you guys, it, 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 it calls for the whole community, parents, um, neighbors, and everyone to help solve these problems. Um, I'm from a region that has, I, I heard, because I haven't been there at all, for such a mm -hmm. while, dengue fever. But I didn't know it was so bad, like what she said. Mm -hmm. Also, um, the coral reef problem, because they're seeing right. more of it. So I really think there's a need for more scientists, yeah. quite a few. But maybe if we have more um, larger forums like this. Mm -hmm. I find that weekends are really great because in the week we're so busy doing everything else, kids especially. So if you want to um, include more kids, you have to have more peer and kid mm -hmm. participation, mm -hmm. like when they have time. There'll be more libraries or whatever. I don't mm -hmm. know. I want to say anything. I also have a comment that said, nature is so fascinating, you know, universe and sciences, and that's why you should, the, the, the kids should have a great opportunity to look into that and explore it more.